Okay, great. So we're now recording. Um, and I'd like, um, I'd like to open with a land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Lena Patterson. Um, I am a settler of German and Scottish descent, and I am located in Toronto. Um, and Toronto is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit um, and is um, under the Treaty 13 um, treaty. Um, that's what we're covered by. And to me, this land acknowledgement means that we recognize that we are all treaty people and we commit to honor and practice these relations in our everyday life. Um, you are all joining us from, um, um, from a different territory, from a different uh, part of the country um, and, are, and are under different treaties as part of, um, part of that um, nation. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and with that, we're going to get right to it. Uh, so this is our webinar today. It's called Planning for Fall 2020, Business as Unusual. Um, and we're joined by some wonderful presenters here today. I'm going to be your moderator. Um, and we have um, Nicole Johnson, the research director from the CDLRA, who is going to take you through uh, the results of the Pulse survey that were recently um, performed. I know you're all very interested to hear about that. And then we have two panelists um, who are joining us to reflect on their thinking for what the fall semester is going to look like. Um, Dr. Tony Bates and Dr. David Porter are both joining us um, to answer your, to, to provide some thoughts and then also to answer your questions um, as they come up throughout the webinar. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nicole. Um, Nicole, please uh, go ahead and, uh, and take over the mic. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, so I'm Nicole Johnson. I'm the research director at CDLRA. And what I'll be doing is I'll be talking about the results of a survey that we conducted. Um, it was done through um, April 24th through May 1st of 2020. So these results are very recent. Um, we had done this study in um, tandem with a study in the US as well. So we're doing a pulse survey in the US and then also a Canadian pulse project. And the objective of this study is to be tracking the response in Canadian higher ed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because as we all know, this year was an incredibly unusual year that threw everything for a loop. And one of the goals of this survey was to find out what was happening and also what are the needs of faculty and administrators in planning for fall. Um, invitations were included in the Academica top 10 and then it went out three times to people, um, April 24th, 28th and May 1st. And we had a sample of 273 faculty and administrators who responded to the survey. So without further ado, we'll get to what we found from this. Um, and as well, I do want to acknowledge our partners, um, Academica Group, eCampus Ontario, and Bayview Analytics. Without our partners, this project would not have been possible. And I wanna highlight my partners on the research team. So um, it was myself, George Lepchanos from Royal Roads University, who were leading the Canadian side with, as well with Dr. Jeff Seaman, who's the director of Bayview Van Analytics in San Francisco. So our findings in planning for fall. As we were going through and analyzing the data, it was around the same time that institutions were telling us that they were, a lot of them were gonna be going fully online, um, at least to start the fall. One of the things that we discovered from the data is that very few um, respondents expected that there would be only one scenario for fall. So people did not answer, oh, classes will be canceled, that'll be it, or classes will be all online, that was it. What we saw is we saw that respondents expected there to be multiple scenarios. They expected there to be pivots, in the fall, um, everyone was in agreement that the school year would go ahead, but the experience would be very different. And so here are what people anticipated for the return to fall. 
So the most common response we saw from colleges was that um, there would be a partial return to in-person courses. Um, this was also the most common response for universities. What we noticed is that there was um, a difference between colleges and universities in the responses, but overall the pattern was pretty similar. Um, we expected to see a lot of um, synchronous learning and then also the idea that some students would return to courses um, on campus, some students would attend classes online. Um, we also saw that there would be options where students would attend asynchronously, but we did see more people, um, more respondents predict that it would be uh, synchronous learning, which was an interesting point. Um, at the same point, it, we had some open-ended responses to, to this as well. And some of the key concerns that emerged from these data was that what happens with things that have to be taught in person or that the perception is there that they have to be taught in person. Some of the biggest concerns surrounded practicum work, lab work, and those types of learning scenarios where that in-person component has always been a very critical piece of the learning experience. We also asked specifically what were the professional development needs. So for example, we asked both faculty and administrators, we asked faculty what were their needs and we asked administrators what they perceived the needs of faculty to be. Um, faculty specifically identified need for training in pedagogical strategies, supporting students and assessment strategies. And the top preferred way that faculty would like to receive professional development, um, according to our responses, was the creation of an online resource, a resource hub, something they could access over the summer as they prepare. On this slide, we share the different choices that we gave faculty in terms of professional development, um, what types of professional development they needed in order to be prepared to teach effectively online in the fall. And that effectively was an important piece in the question because we wanted to dig deep and go past what they needed to do emergency remote teaching and actually look at what they needed in order to feel confident and to teach effectively online. So um, again, we saw the top three pedagogical strategies, support for student, um, supporting students, assessment strategies. The things that they needed least were just how to work effectively from home. Um, yet we still had a, about a third of administrators saying that faculty needed, could use some professional development and support with that. Um, another thing that came up, and it came up in the open-ended questions as well, that was critical was supporting students with accessibility needs. And there were numerous open-ended comments that reflected that um, helping students was top of mind, particularly for faculty and how to make the transition to online smoother for them and to be aware of what their specific needs were. So with that, we have, we have several poll questions um, incorporated into this presentation just to get a sense of where you're at in this. So I'm going to put on the poll option here and I'm going to give you a few minutes or not a few minutes, sorry, about 30 seconds to a minute to respond and you'll notice that you can just select to the question, do you feel that faculty at your institution have the necessary supports to prepare for this fall? And we've got options yes, no, unsure, not applicable. And um, my understanding, and Lena, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, we have set it up so the responses to the polls are anonymous. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Now, um, are you able to see the poll? Have you started it, Nicole? I am launching it right now. There Wonderful. we go. So okay. everyone should see it on their end. Response is coming in perfect.
Oh, well, yeah, and very, very fast responses here. This is really interesting to see this in real time. Um, so very interesting as we're seeing the responses coming in so far, we have almost a split between um, yes and unsure. Um, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds just as responses are slowing down here. And I think when I hit end poll, everyone will be able to see the results. All right, so I'm going to, we had 134 people who are on the webinar right now respond to this. And so you should be able to see that, um, oh, and I think I can share results here. Let me know if you're not seeing them. Okay, there we go. So you should see, you'll be able to see that all of, from all of us who are on the webinar right now, we have 42% who think, yes, faculty at your institution have the necessary supports and the second highest answer is unsure at 33%. So a fairly good split between those two. So Tony and David, we'll let you two speak to that when we get to the Q and A. But that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting point there. Okay, so moving on to the next, and we're talking. We also asked about partnerships. So what we asked faculty is, and in administrators is, would it be va valuable to have partnerships in the fall? And what types of partnerships would be most valuable to them as they prepare for fall? We did know from previous uh, CDLRA surveys, um, if you're not familiar with the work of CDLRA, we've conducted national surveys across Canada for uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019 and one of our key findings from our surveys has been that um, institutions feel that partnerships with both other institutions and outside um, outside organizations would be valuable particularly for developing online learning uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated that need and that was clear in the responses we also got uh, the open-ended responses to this question. So for each question, we had just an opportunity for a respondents to just add an open-ended response. And through those responses, uh, we, there was indication that our respondents were interested in partnerships with other institutions as well as non-institutional partners. So what partnerships would be valuable in preparing for fall? Um, the top answer for both um, for universities was other institutions in our province. Um, for colleges, it was have technology and service providers. Um, we also saw a strong response for national academic organizations. Um, still more than half of uh, respondents from both colleges and universities said institutions in other provinces. So we see a strong um, desire for institutional partnerships and also partnerships with other organizations. Which brings me then to our second poll. And so that would be, has your institution partnered with other institutions or organizations in preparing for fall. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And again, your responses, uh, we have yes, no, unsure, or not applicable. So right now we have about 90 of you, almost 100 who have respond, responded. And it's really interesting because we're seeing quite a split right now. Um, it's fascinating watching these results come in in real time. So there's a question in the chat, Nicole, um, about whether or not um, we're talking about official partnerships here. Would you mind clarifying that? Yeah, so I think we're going to we consider it to be um, informal partnerships too. 
Um, so we didn't clarify that in the survey, whether it was official or informal, but I would consider this to be informal, such as working with other institutions. And I think that that's actually a very good point to delineate in uh, future studies. So thank you for that question. All right, I think we have, the responses are slowing down. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with you. Uh, 134 people on this webinar and answered this question. And you can see a really good split. So has your institution partnered with other institutions or organizations in preparing for fall? We have the highest response with unsure. Uh, we also have 24%, so about a quarter of you saying yes, and another quarter saying no, and 15%, which had not applicable. So then, the final thing that we asked, which was a really interesting, um, got really interesting results from this one, in terms of the light, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to know how this was impacting perceptions of the future. And we wanted to know um, whether what was happening on the ground was leading respondents to feel more optimistic or pessimistic about the future of higher ed in Canada. What was really interesting is that it was a very bimodal response so respondents were either optimistic <laughs> or they were pessimistic about the future. We didn't have a whole lot of middle ground. We found that administrators were more optimistic than faculty. And we found that faculty were more pessimistic than administrators. And I'll show you the two charts in a second with that. Most respondents um, anticipated that the lasting change resulting from the pandemic would be minor. And some of the responses we saw in the open-ended data, um, it just indicated that, you know, higher ed is a, is a slow, moving, slow moving beast that uh, it would, it, where things would settle may not be all that different from where we are now, despite this, the disruption that is COVID-19. So when we look at the charts here, we've got the faculty chart on the top and we've got the administrator responses on the bottom. We separated these just to see the difference. And what we can see with the faculty, we have you know, just over 40% that indicated they were optimistic to some extent. And then we have another 43% that were somewhat pessimistic so and then we also have another five which are very pessimistic so almost half were pessimistic and a reasonable proportion were optimistic as well with oops with the administrators we have um, a much higher proportion that were either very optimistic or optimistic and then very few um, just over 20 percent indicated some form of pessimism. We also had a higher proportion of administrators that were neutral on this. So one final poll before I wrap up my part and turn it over to uh, Tony and David to share their thoughts is um, considering the current pandemic, are you personally, we're going to ask you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the overall future of higher ed? And so I'm just going to turn on this final poll. And your options are optimistic, pessimistic, or neutral. So just so you know, Nicole, while people are filling out the poll, there was one question in the chat um, about uh, whether or not you could expand on the reasons why faculty were pessimistic. Did you ask those kinds of questions? So what we did is we gave an open-ended response. Um, we didn't ask specifically, I don't, Think I don't, I'll double check. I've got the data here actually. Um, if I'm able, what I'll do is when Tony and um, David are presenting, I'm just going to take a look and double check to make sure I can answer that accurately. Great. Okay, perfect. And we'll bring I'll that get back, back after. Yeah. Awesome. 
All right, so I am going to, we've got the results are slowing down here. So I'm gonna end this poll and I'm gonna share the results. And the, the good news is uh, a lot of you are very optimistic about the overall future of higher ed over the next two years. So that's fantastic. <laughs> and the next common response is neutral. So interestingly, the people who are on here um, overall are much more optimistic than pessimistic. All right, so with that, that ends my portion of this. Um, I've put my contact information here. If, um, if there's any questions that do come up after the fact, uh, do get in touch with us. That's the way to contact me directly and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And I'm going to turn it over to Tony to continue this. <laughs> you're going to you're going to turn it over to me, who's going to then to turn it over to Tony. <laughs> There's a quick question. There's a couple questions in the chat for you, Nicole. You can check those out while um, while Tony is speaking. Um, and there was also a request for the slides as well. So I just don't want to make sure that doesn't get lost. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much, Nicole. That was great. The polls were awesome. People really liked the polls. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tony Bates, a leading scholar and influential thinker uh, in the field of digital learning. Uh, Tony was a founding member of the British Open University and has held several positions in the Open Learning Agency and at the University of British Columbia. Tony is the author of 12 books, 12 books, <laughs> including the one I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is Teaching in the Digital Age, now translated into 10 languages. Um, and having been downloaded over 100,000 times. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tony. I've only got a few things to say, really. Um, the two things that are bothering me about what's going to happen in September. The first one is the, the very large first year lecture classes and how that's going to be handled. My fear is that obviously it's people will not be happy to put 200 students into a room for an hour together um, and will probably want to, to deliver their lectures online and we there's so much research showing that one hour lectures delivered online don't work very well for students and particularly for the first year students who probably are looking for the most social and uh, cultural aspects of being on campus and uh, they're not going to get that, that's for sure. But this seems to me to be an opportunity to really re-examine the fundamental teaching model in first year courses. Um, it's possible now for students to find con all content on the web. In, in British Columbia, and I think also in Ontario now, every first and second year course in universities and colleges has an open textbook that students can download. So why aren't we looking at uh, getting students to do the work in putting together, say, a lecture and so on, rather than the faculty doing it for them? Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. Uh, you can put them in groups and so on. So my hope is that institutions will take a really hard look at their first year teaching and decide not just for COVID-19, but for generally to relook at how they're doing that kind of teaching. And the second point, I want to make is about faculty development. Uh, we don't have a very good system of faculty development, uh, not just here in Canada, but anywhere. Many faculty are subject experts and not teaching experts. Um, and that's particularly true in the colleges, but also in many of the universities. And we don't have a systemic system for ensuring that all our faculty are properly trained in teaching. And this has come up very clearly in the COVID-19 issue. If you don't have a good pedagogical background, it's very hard to move online and readjust your teaching appropriately. So how do we scale up that faculty development across the institution so that every faculty member has what I would like to call a learning plan for how they can improve their teaching each year? And scaling up that support to faculty, I think is going to be a really big challenge for most institutions. So I'm going to stop at that point. That's wonderful, Tony. Those are, those are, those are two really important 
things that you're going to leave people to think about that we can carry over into the Q&A. Nicole, would you mind going to the next slide for me, please? Um, so next up, we've got Dr. David Porter. David is my former boss um, and colleague, um, a luminary in the field of open education and educational technology and longtime advocate for the benefits of adapting new technology to deliver educational opportunities. David has held posts um, at Humber College, um, at eCampus Ontario, at BCIT and BC Campus, and is now um, settled into a new role as Senior Advisor Higher Education at the Commonwealth of Learning. So David, why don't you go ahead and Nicole will um, move your slides for you. So much, Lena. Um, I wanted to just ground this in my experience at Humber College in the fall, right from the start, in the spring, sorry, right from the start of the COVID crisis. And the, the dilemma that we were faced with uh, was really, um, do we help faculty to gently complete their spring semester or do we treat this as the teachable moment for really uh, going whole hog in a transformative approach to teaching and learning? And uh, we, we did both, actually. We were very gentle and supportive with faculty uh, to complete their spring semesters, uh, most importantly, focusing on assessment, uh, which was a big question for people to how could I uh, complete my assessment in a way that I could substantiate that my students are complete, both the curriculum and the assessment, and I can certify that they have the knowledge or skills we need. And so we were very proactive in doing that. But it soon became apparent that the college wanted to continue business as usual. And so we were saddled with putting 455 courses online for a summer semester that started in mid-May. And so it compelled us to actually come up with a rapid development process that not only helped faculty work through a constructive alignment model of putting together courses in a really smart way, but also support them with training and individual support to make sure that they felt the confidence needed to move into the online space going forward. And as it progressed, it was pretty clear to us that the fall was shaping up to be even bigger at Humber with close to 2,500 courses being ready to go online. So this was the process we used to get the summer started. And if Nicole will just push it to the next slide. Um, what we did was build a self-directed support hub for faculty to use um, that not only gave them resources that they could self-servicely use, they could also uh, ask for training and support in any of the aspects of the process. And so we were very much trying to move towards a self-service model, treating it as a transformative moment, dealing with things in a kind of proactive way. But as, as you might expect in a large polytechnic environment, there was a quest for normalcy and especially from technical programs that had labs or specialized equipment or commercial kitchens or clinics and many of those kinds of things to engage with. It's the real world after all, and we have enrollments and we have students and we have expectations. So trying to figure that out, uh, we decided this was going to be an iterative process. And so we started talking about iterating towards fall 2020. And so this was our second attempt. And all of the resources I'm pointing to here are freely available on the Humber website. You can go there and find these by just, by just simply doing a search for faculty support tools. And that was our decision to make them open and available to anyone who wanted to use them. Uh, I, seeing Nicole's survey results that uh, Jeff and Tony and, and Tricia and others have been involved with, clearly there is a need for, for us to share resource hubs of this, this type. And even simply creating a directory of those hubs would be a good thing to do. Uh, building out bigger open resource repositories or a federated approach to a resources in an open repository would also be great. Um, I think I'm not. I'm not surprised by any of the polls. 
Um, I think most people think we are fairly prepared and, we, and everyone has tried really hard by rolling up their sleeves to support their faculty and their students. I'm not surprised by the partnership poll either. I think the tyranny of the urgent drove everyone to focus on their own constituency first and now's the time to reflect and think about how we might do it better. And I think overall uh, there is a new sense of professionalism associated with this crisis we found ourselves in that people have learned, faculty have learned over the course of a few months that they have the capability to teach in multiple modalities from face to face to online and they need to savor that and build upon it and I think the future actually looks fairly bright. What I would hate to see is a quest for normal continuing in to get us back to somewhere where we were previous to COVID, it, we need to move the agenda ahead. And I think we have retooled in ways to help us achieve that. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I'm gonna drop a little summary of what you said in the chat and you can correct it if it's, if it's off, but I wanted everybody to have a record um, a little bit. They probably have one in their own head, but a record of kind of what um, David and Tony have brought forward um, to you so that you have a lot to go on as we move into the Q&A portion. Um, and so there is um, one question already. I'd like to just remind everybody to please put your questions. If you have one and you want it answered, please put it in the Q&A feature. Because if you put it in the chat, we might lose it. And it's, and it's easy for it to kind of become part of the stream. And uh, it's a pretty fast moving stream. So if you would like um, your question to kind of bubble to the top, please put it in the Q&A feature. And um, so I'm going to start with uh, a, a note. Um, that Chris has put in the Q&A, he says, and then I'm just gonna ask you, David, Nicole, and Tony to reflect on. He says, the big challenge we have with faculty in Ontario is we develop professional development learning plans on a three-year cycle. While we talk all the time about development, there are not a lot of good tools for online transitions for applied learning and skills development. So I wonder, David, whether that's, um, I mean, both David and Tony might be interested in jumping in on this, but there's definitely a link there to your, to your move towards the iterative, David. Yeah, thanks for that, Lena. And Chris, thanks for your question. Yeah, it's definitely true. I mean, I think that uh, courses that are uh, skill-based and, and require hands-on uh, are the courses that need alternative delivery mechanisms for us to consider and experiment with. And, and those would be the kinds of things like simulations and VR and AR and, and other kinds of tools that are really in their infancy for broad-based scalable uh, learning. Um, so I think one of the ways to get there is to actively experiment with them in a modular basis within one module of a course or program. And there are plenty of people in the trades and technology area working with ideas of that sort right now. My colleague Chad Flynn at BCIT is a leader in this space thinking about how to do that effectively and flipping the paradigm for uh, trades training uh, using uh, other kinds of means to get at skills. But you're right, it takes time and uh, we need to be proactive uh, in doing that work. The, the folks at eCampus Ontario have been running all kinds of adaptive training pilot projects to get a better handle on other ways to get at skills training uh, using media-based adaptive training systems. Tony, do you want to jump in on that as well, faculty training? Well, I, I think this is an area where partnerships could be incredibly helpful. Um, I think that well, many to develop these tools is not a cheap process. Um, and what's often happened is where people have tried to do simulations and so on uh, in these areas, the quality hasn't been very good, mainly because it's an individual instructor working maybe with one uh, uh, faculty support team. Uh, if we could get, say, um, 
you know, a number of institutions to come together, a number of instructors across different institutions and create good quality materials in this area that can be used right th throughout the field, then I think we could make a, an impact in this area. I never see these tools as completely replacing hands-on, but it can reduce the time needed uh, with, with being hands-on. And that would therefore, if you're talking about spreading out um, students across, you know, over a period of time, then these tools can be very valuable for that. Uh, as David mentioned, BCIT has partnerships with other polytechnics in developing some virtual reality developments and so on. And, but it's still a fairly small group working together. Uh, if we could have a national project on this, I think it would be very good. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, as people start to think about, you know, there's a lot of institutions in Ontario that are that are looking forward to a, a mixed or some kind of mixed approach, you know, some on campus, some off campus. So there still needs to be um, a lot of, of good stuff happening in an, in an online environment. And there are tools that can that can allow for that in person time to be less and maybe a little bit more effective. Um, so there's a really interesting question in the chat from Rosa that has been upvoted multiple times. So I think we need to address it. Um, she says, what are your thoughts about international students not being able to travel and just having online courses may hinder the multicultural experience of going abroad and having a full learning experience? Who wants I'll to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a very good question. I, I, I mean, it, I have the same feeling also about a lot of K to 12 education it, that there are things you just can't replace with online learning and uh, the, the ability to have that multicultural experience by living in another country is almost impossible to replicate fully online. You can do some things towards that and so on. And what, one thing I think we, we need to be thinking about generally, not just for international students, is how we build a kind of social environment online that's more than just the teaching and learning um, aspect. I uh, think, think we could be thinking about that too. There are various ways we could be using social media, for instance, for getting people to get a, a sense of community. Um, I think there's two issues here. I think eventually the international students will come back uh, on campus. But what's been very interesting is that very, very few uh, Canadian universities uh, have fully online students before COVID-19. Nearly all students were within province doing online courses. That came out very clearly from the last survey that uh, CDLRA did. Uh, I think there's two completely different markets here. I think one market is the uh, basically international students from wealthy middle-class families in other countries who can afford for, this, for, the, for, for their children to come to another country with all the costs that go with that. But beneath that, there is another huge market for, for um, students who can't afford to come and live in Canada, but would still like to have uh, Canadian qualifications. Uh, and Again, we wouldn't charge the enormous fees that we would charge, we're charging for the on-campus students for this. And I, I think there's a big market there that hasn't really been tested. And I understand why international offices are terrified that anything that will undermine their on-campus uh, international students um, should be avoided. But I, I think it's two d entirely different markets. Okay, why don't we move on to the next question then. Um, if David, you didn't have anything to add on the international international piece. Um, okay, so there's an interesting question here um, about equity. Uh, equity is an important consideration, which I'm not sure we are ready to address with our course planning and support. What would you recommend as ways we can address equity in our online course planning? Yeah, it's David. Um, I think there are, uh, I think one of the interesting things that many institutions did was begin to do pulse surveys with their students to actually ask their students uh, how they were feeling, what they needed, and how we could address issues of equity and access for those students during the start of the crisis. I know while I was at Humber, we did a survey, there were 12,000 student responses within a week which pointed out uh, two or three high priority areas that dealt with equity, uh, access to technology and bandwidth, 
just access to community and, and the, the social needs that people had, including food and food security and, and how we could address those. And simply counseling advice and support for people around mental health and how that could be distributed more equitably around the, uh, the student body. Um, I think um, many institutions um, are also building team-based approaches. I know while I was at Humber building our rapid course development model, we created a team-based approach that brought in uh, accessibility uh, coordination, uh, indigenous coordination as all part of our team-based strategy for building out courses. And, and unless we, you're proactive in doing that, you're going to miss those opportunities. So I think it has to do with understanding the student body, understanding their needs, and building structures that address them effectively. I recommend everybody would look at a recent report that's come out of BC campus on equity on online learning, um, and particularly the way we design our courses uh, to take more account of uh, 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 cultural and uh, uh, racial differences and so on. Um, and I think we can improve the design of our courses to make them um, not just physically accessible, which is also important. I mean, there's, there is a significant, a small but significant group of students who just can't afford to do online learning. Um, but apart from that, there's also, uh, the, the, the line in the report I like is that the design of instruction is not culturally neutral. And that to me is a hugely significant statement. Um, and I think we need to find better ways of incorporating other cultural perspectives into the design of our courses. It, it's very simple things like the graphics you use, for instance, uh, in a course. Um, I think we should be much more sensitive to cultural issues on this and we should have much more input from different cultural groups into, uh, into the design of our courses. Uh, now this is, this is not, not directly related to COVID-19, um, but I think it's a general issue we, we need to pay more attention to. Thank you, Tony. And I dropped the link to that report, the BC Campus report in the chat. So if anybody is interested in, in checking it out, it is there for you now. Um, um, Lena, I just want to jump cool. in too, because this is, uh, th those are two very good segues to the question that I'm supposed to answer as well about- Oh yes, of course. <laughs> good memory. <laughs> I know. Go ahead. Um, Cause I went through and I just wanted to make sure I was pulling at my, pulling from my notes what the responses were. Um, and so in front of me, I have the main reasons for pessimism are financial challenges, uh, particularly reliance on enrollments from international students. And also another one would be student ability to succeed and particularly student inequities. So those two questions that were just answered. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then the other response related just to workload and planning and concerns about that. So those were the three main themes that emerged in the open-ended comments surrounding, surrounding pessimism. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, good, good for you, Nicole. Thanks for yeah. jumping in on that. Oh, there's so many good questions in here. Um, okay. The one that's been upvoted a couple of times that we should probably deal with, um, it takes us a little bit away from the, the, the kind of considerations of, of the student and the faculty member and back up to a systemic level. Um, and the question is, who could and should take the lead in developing a collection of resources for online teaching and learning resources? That's David. I mean, uh, many provinces in, in Canada have provincial agencies like BC Campus, C Campus Ontario, Campus Manitoba. Um, I think there needs to be a meeting of minds, a confederation of repositories in the Canadian sense, and really a, a proactive approach to uh, avoiding redundancies by building on what already exists. I know there's a project happening in the university sector to build uh, resources. I see that as a redundancy. That, that already exists. Like, where'd that come from? Um, we need to be more sensible about these things and uh, utilize resources in a sensible way. So I throw it over to the Lena Pattersons and Mary Burgesses and 
and uh, Kims of uh, Manitoba to really put their heads together with uh, uh, CI Can and uh, Universities Canada to really come up with something that is truly natural and reach. Tony, did you want to add anything on that? Not really. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, I've already said I think we need more collaboration and cooperation, and I yeah. think Canada is a great country where that can happen. It just needs. Uh, to get our heads above, you know, try not to drown at the moment and just look at where we want to swim to. And uh, exactly. I think, you know, one of the shores we want to swim to is more collaboration and cooperation. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, they keep shifting. Um, okay. There's one that's been upvoted a couple times uh, here at the top. So that's the easiest place to start. How do we ensure that this tyranny of the urgent, so that's in quotes from you, David, I think, uh, does not become a tool for furthering the neoliberal co corporatization of universities uh, and various related agendas, including that of reducing the on-campus experience and options for small in-person learning? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. And um, I just saw a document yesterday from the International uh, sort of un uh, Association of Universities that made some very clear statements on uh, what our expectations are for higher education and how they could be better uh, emphasized so that we're not going in these corporatization directions as a part of this process. Uh, my colleagues in the open education movement would uh, say right away that this is an opportunity for collaborative investment of uh, like-minded humans who want to build resources that fit along a continuum of practice from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And we should be uh, focused on coming up with the models and practices that best fit the situation, the context, or a particular need of learners. Um, everyone realizes that uh, education happens in many different ways. Uh, right now, we're simply focused on dealing with a challenge of no collective opportunity for people to get together, but soon that will probably change. And what we really need to do is focus our efforts, as Tony mentioned, on collaborative development and resources, tools, and practices that support all modalities of learning and the more free and open those become, the closer we get to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, education shall be free. Um, and that's what we should be aiming for. I was interested to see in the survey results that um, some Canadian institutions, but relatively few, were looking at partnerships with online, commercial online uh, program managers. Uh, this is very different to the situation in the States, I think. I mean, Jeff Seaman might want to comment on that. But um, I, I do think there, there is a danger here that um, we've already seen governments thinking of online learning as a cheaper form of education um, and the idea of outsourcing some of it. So I think there is a danger here. Um, but... Uh, I, I, I'm optimistic in terms of in, in terms of Canadians understanding the value of a public education system and uh, that online learning fits very well in terms of it can fit very well in terms of increasing access and offering more opportunities to people to learn that it doesn't have to be commercialized to do that. Thanks. Thank you both. Good answers um, to a complicated question. Um, there's another one in here that's been upvoted a, a couple of times. It says, faculty belief systems pro and con traditionally is a large influencer in adoption of remote and on online delivery. Uh, can you speak to that in the current environment? For example, supporting seamless transitions face-to-face -to, -face to remote while addressing concerns some faculty may have about the efficacy of remote delivery. Perhaps I can start this one, David. Um, I, I've been surprised and delighted by uh, the flexibility of faculty uh, over COVID-19. I, I would have expected much more kickback um, than we've seen. Um, 
to finding a solution. You know, it wasn't the ideal solution. Nobody likes the kind of remote learning that's being done, but faculty, I think, generally have been amazingly open to trying some things, to try and do things differently in order to keep a service going to their students. So I, I'm really impressed by that. Um, I, I think what the real problem here is uh, the difficulty of making a transition of this kind without any pedagogical background. I think that uh, one of the comments I heard from the president of virtual uh, of, uh, Vancouver Island University is that faculty have felt disenfranchised by this move. They, they've lost their autonomy to some extent. Now, I, I think that's an issue that we need to need to address that we, we have to give faculty the feeling that they actually can control what's happening and that they can input to this and they can come up with their own solutions. And I think we should be looking very hard at new ways of doing things that may be outside the box. We have a whole set of best practices for online learning, but I think we can be learning from faculty here who've come up with innovative solutions that we would never have thought of as experts in this field. Totally agree with Tony. Um, I think in faculty's minds, students come first in, in most cases and uh, they will do their utmost to provide the best experience they can for their students. I think what I see faculty reacting to are uh, tools or practices that don't suit their particular styles or the context in which they operate. And I think we uh, have to some degree commoditized the offerings and the ways that we offer courses in the online environment within uh, institutional environments and we haven't provided sufficient degrees of freedom for experimentation and pushing boundaries of practice and so I think we need to be more experimental we need to have more sandboxes not only at the provincial level but on campuses and mm. allow faculty to mold those tools to their needs great okay we have five minutes left and so I thought this might be a good opportunity to ask a question that's in the chat that is maybe a good one to leave it on because it sets us thinking forward. Uh, so the question is, and maybe you can both answer in, you know, a short-ish amount of time so we can get, get everybody on with their day. The question is, how would you foresee this transforming post-secondary education in the long term? Tony, why don't we start with you on this one? Uh, that's a huge question and I think every institution needs a strategic plan for digital learning, how it's going to move forward over the next few years to support digital learning. Um, it's, it's not going to go away, it's going to increase in importance. Um, by digital learning, I don't just mean online learning, I mean how, how are you going to integrate uh, digital learning into your classroom teaching for instance, how are you going to do blended learning? Um, how are you going to support the expansion of this through your institution? What's the impact going to be on buildings, uh, classroom space and so on, if students are bringing digital work into class and, and wanting to demonstrate that within the class and so on. Uh, so I, if your institution doesn't have a plan for digital learning, I think they, they're going to fall well, well behind. And, and we are seeing many institutions now implementing those, those digital learning plans, but I think they're going to speed up and I think they're going to become even more critical to the success of the institution. David. I think the crisis has crystallized the need, as Tony has noted, for a really uh, state-of-the-art uh, strategic planning process and one that is iterative and has and really needs to be re revisited on an annual basis as the context changes or imperatives change or tools change. I think this is really a dynamic period that we've entered for higher education and sometimes it takes a crisis to move us forward and reground us up on how we might better proceed. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. So with that, I am going to um, call an end to this session. Thank you everyone so much for your um, 
interesting questions, uh, for throwing them all at us, uh, for engaging with each other in the chat. I was absolutely thrilled to see each other commenting on, on, on questions as they were coming through, both in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so we are going to uh, follow up with you uh, after this webinar. We're going to make sure you have a, a link to the recording. We're going to make sure you've got um, the slides and we are going to do everything we can to uh, answer the questions that went unanswered um, in the Q&A. So I want to thank everybody so much for coming, for participating um, and for joining us today to talk about these, these big questions. Thank you, Nicole and the CDLRA group for hosting us. Okay, take care everybody. Stay safe.